Is there a climate crisis? Are there more extreme weather events? Are fossil fuels to blame? And is it possible to live in a world without fossil fuels? Chris Wright is the CEO of Liberty Energy, who has dedicated his career to finding the most efficient energy sources. Let's cut through the political bias and have an honest conversation about climate change and fossil fuels. Chris, thank you so much for sitting down with me. Thrilled to be here, Marissa. I want to start with the elephant in the room. This conversation is about climate change, it's about fossil fuels, and it's about these issues that create a lot of tension right now in our country. And you are in the fossil fuel world. I mean, you're really in the trenches. You're an investor, you run a company, you've been outspoken about your thoughts on this issue. And I know that people are gonna hit me up and say, well, why are you interviewing someone who has really a vested interest in us working with more fossil fuels? So let's just address that. Why do you think that you should be the right person to speak about it? And then I will bring in my personal interpretation of why I think it's important to speak to somebody like you about this issue. Great, I mean, that's only natural reaction, of course. You wish people would engage with ideas more than who the, who the person is saying them. But I mean, of course, that's human nature. But my story is a little bit different. You know, I, I grew up also in a time where there was this fear of the world ending. Fossil fuels were also the bad guys then, but the fear was we were gonna run out of them. This is early 80s when I'm in high school. You know, industrial civilization was gonna collapse. We needed a new energy source. Solar was hot then. There was a talk about a wind, although it never took off much back then. But I went to MIT specifically to work on fusion energy. Running out of fossil fuels, the world needs energy. Mm -hmm. I quickly realized I didn't have the patience for big science. Ended up going to graduate school briefly at UC Berkeley, and I worked in solar energy there. And then geothermal energy in graduate school and a little bit afterwards. So I don't care where energy comes from. It's just gotta be affordable, reliable, and better people's lives. I did get into the oil and gas business. My wife, thankfully, is, is how I got here. And today, the opposition to fossil fuels that I do push back against, but the opposition to fossil fuels is actually tremendous for my business and for the business of all of my customers. Because think about that. It, it, this doesn't do anything to change the demand for oil and natural gas. But if you incrementally restrict the supply of those things, you just drive up the prices. Today, we have artificially high prices for oil and natural gas, and we have absolutely record profitability at my company, Liberty Energy, and at my customers' companies. So interesting. So it's actually in your best interest that there'll be more regulations and less supply of fossil fuel because you essentially would then be able to, you know, charge more and make more money. Yeah. If you make an essential commodity scarce, the price will go up every time. Right. Uh, but you're not one of those. I'm not for making it scarce. <laughs> <laughs> I want to make it abundant. I'm, I'm the weird oil right. and gas guy that celebrates lower prices. The shale revolution, you know, of the last decade or 15 years, to me, the greatest thing it did was dramatically lower global oil prices, dramatically lower global natural mm -hmm. gas prices, saving consumers around the world, you know, one to two trillion dollars a year. I'm proud of that. Yeah. I would say the other reason why I wanted to sit down with someone like you as opposed to, you know, a researcher or a scholar, and we've done many, many interviews with, you know, whether it's Michael Schellenberger or Steve Koonin or Alex Epstein, who I'm going to speak a little bit about their books and how they've influenced me. The reason I wanted to sit with you is because you are in the trenches. You're in the trenches. You're putting your money, your time, you're investing, I mean, uh, such a big portion of your life. And so you really know what it's like to work with fossil fuels. And I, I, I want to have a real authentic conversation with someone without the politics, without any skin in the game, because frankly, I'm raising three kids on this planet. I live here. I want to have a good environment. I don't want to be attacked by hurricanes. I don't want to have my cities flooded. I don't want to have polluted air. I don't want to drink polluted water. You know, I want to hear the real deal. I don't want a politically charged conversation. I want the truth. And so my hope is that given that you're in the trenches, I can ask you some of these difficult questions that I think many families around the country are, are really wondering about. I do think it's one of the mistakes of our industry, you know, that it doesn't speak out very much. And then when it does, it's sort of carefully scripted talking points. No one believes carefully scripted talking points. When I go speak at universities, I, it goes well, generally because 
I only have one way I speak. It's honest and candid. It may be embarrassing. I may be saying things I shouldn't say, but that's just the way I roll. But I think if you speak sincerely, that's the only thing people listen to anyway. Okay, so I'm going to start asking you some questions. The bottom line, first question is, is the climate changing and should we worry about it? Climate is changing. Both, it's always changing because of natural forces, but human impacts today are definitely significant enough that they are additive. They are a meaningful force in and of themselves driving changes in the climate. So we should be concerned about it. We should be focused on it. We should be studying it. But to date, the changes are rather modest, rather slow moving. There's almost as many positive changes. The planet's getting greener and agricultural productivity is going up with more plant food in the air. It's probably almost as many positive changes as there are negative changes. But you know, that calculus probably changes with time. So it's a very real issue, dominantly caused by our industry. So real issue, yes. Is it a crisis? Is it the world's greatest challenge or a big threat to the next generation? No. Well, wouldn't it be a huge threat to the next generation if you're saying that you know, the use of fossil fuels is heating the earth? I mean, you can't, you can't scale that back. And so why are you saying it's not you know, something that we should be alarmed about? Well, in the last 100 plus years, the world's warmed a little over one degree C. And again, to date, probably more positive than negative. Five times more people die from the cold than die from the heat globally. And a little bit warmer planet also means a little bit wetter planet necessarily, those two to get go together. That drives up agricultural productivity. Most of the increase in agricultural productivity, I think is technology, better farming practices, better fertilizers. But the climate's been a little bit of a tailwind there. At the time of the founding of our nation in what was called the Little Ice Age, life's a little bit tougher if it's a degree or two degrees C colder. So a little bit warmer uh, is, isn't a threat. If we were five, seven, eight, ten 10 degrees C warmer, that would be meaningful changes to the planet. Um, humans would likely adapt, but it, could, it would be disruptive for sure. I mean, it, it is an issue and it should be considered as such. Okay, so you're saying that fossil fuels are increasing or decreasing the temperature of the climate. And increasing. It, it, it is increasing the temperature of the climate. And so you're saying that right now it's not that much, but if we don't stop using the fossil fuels, isn't it going to get worse? We don't know is the real answer. Um, the warming certainly will continue. It's a logarithmic function. So the amount of carbon dioxide we put in the atmosphere the last 70 or 80 years, if we put that same amount in probably in a shorter time period in the next 20 or 30 years, the impact of that will be much less than the original molecules. It's logarithmic. You have to double the concentration again to get the same impact you've got. Well, so far, it's just been a 50% rise. But the, the, the effect should continue to grow, absolutely. We should monitor it. The IPCC has done extensive economic worth, work on it, and their estimates are maybe a 0.2 to 2 or 3% reduction in per capita income around the end of this century. So that's negative. Two or 3% of a you know, $100 trillion global economy is a lot of money. But you know, that's a few months of economic growth between now and the year 2100. We have 10 million easily preventable deaths on the planet today that we could solve. And of course, the most important ingredient in solving those is to energize those people that are living in energy poverty. So climate change is a negative, but there's bigger negatives and more solvable negatives in the short term technology and societal evolution will eventually decarbonize our economy. But, you know, that's probably a hundred years of, of order that time frame to do that. We simply don't have the technologies to do it today. Can you explain how fossil fuels work? Because we're hearing the term fossil fuels and we're hearing climate change and we're hearing them together, mostly in, in terms of we need to give up our fossil fuels because it's heating up the climate. But I think what would be helpful to understand is how important are fossil fuels to our daily lives? Like, how do they actually provide us with whatever it is that we have today? And what would it look like if we didn't have fossil fuels, for example? Well, 30 years ago, the world got about 87% of its total energy from fossil fuels. 30 years, several trillion dollars of, of subsidies, mandates, desires for an energy transition. But we've gone from 87% to about 83% in 30 years. So we are slowly reducing the percent of fossil fuels in, in, in the total world energy system, but world demand for coal, oil, and natural gas today are at all-time highs. So, you know, they're a dominant source of energy. Over 60% of clothing fabrics globally are made of fossil fuels. Our cars, the painting, our plastics, our iPhones, the internet, 
fertilizers in food is just incredibly important. Fossil fuel agricultural is why the world supports 8 billion people today, or just 150 years ago, we had a billion people mostly in wretched poverty. So it's pretty game-changing technology that has allowed people to live longer, healthier, more opportunity-rich lives and all these fancy materials, and we can fly around the planet and ride, drive a car to go visit grandma for dinner 100 miles away. These were just unimaginable before the arrival of fossil fuels. One of the things that helped me really wrap my head around the whole concept of fossil fuels is that it's not necessarily just about electricity or, or gas in your car, but the biggest consumer of fossil fuels are actually the agriculture industries. Is that right? And how does that work? And would that mean that if we stop using fossil fuels, then our food basket essentially would be much more expensive because how would we you know, get agriculture? D dramatically. Manufacturing is the largest user of fossil fuels, and I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. But agriculture, maybe we could say, is the most important users of fossil fuels. You think of tractors and mechanized farming, materials, those big storage bins, the ability to transport grain all around the country and all around the world. All those are, of course, important, but let me just focus on one, which is nitrogen fertilizer. Historically, the biggest limiter in how much food grows in a certain plot of land is nitrogen in the soil. This came from planting peas or legumes when you did crop rotation, came from bat guano and human waste, night soil, they call it in India until recently, their largest source of new nitrogen into their soils. But about 100 years ago, two German chemists developed a Haber-Bosch process that takes natural gas and a catalyst at high temperature, where natural gas supplies both the energy and the raw material, the hydrogen, that is then stripped from the carbon and bound onto a nitrogen atom that makes nitrogen fertilizer synthetically produced and dispersed on soils. So if we took out just this one piece of hydrocarbons, synthesized nitrogen fertilizer, global food production would drop in half. Of course, not only would crop prices go up, but you know, within a few years, of order half the planet would starve, maybe less than half because everyone else would just be on smaller calorie diets. But it would be absolutely transformative to world living condition if you remove fossil fuels just from that one sector. We don't know starvation in America, right? I mean, I know my grandparents w would have known about it and the, the Great you know, Depression where you had to stand in line to get food, but that would be a reality again. Quickly. I mean, if you got rid of nitrogen fertilizer, with, certainly within 12 months, there would be food lines. We would have starvation on a, on a large scale. I have so many whys in my head right now, but let me start with this. Why would they push for wind and solar? Wind and solar doesn't solve this issue of agriculture, given the agriculture is so dependent on fossil fuels. And so when they want to go zero on fossil fuels, how are these policymakers answering the question of agriculture and manufacturing if, in fact, the biggest consumer of the fossil fuels are not necessarily, you know, turn on the lights or drive, you know, Teslas or whatever cars they're claiming that we will, will solve this fossil fuel issue. Like, it just doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah, like, look, energy is complicated and it's hard. And when you hear politicians say that, they don't have a deep, well-thought-out plan about all these questions you're asking. It's politically popular. Youth of today loves it. Solar and wind are sort of romantic, but solar and wind are only in the electricity sector, right? Electricity is 20% of delivered global energy. We paved the whole planet in solar panels and got all our electricity from that. That'd be 20%. We'd still have to supply the other 80% of energy. And that other, the biggest piece of that other 80% is manufacturing. There's sort of four materials that make up the modern world. Cement, steel, plastics, and fertilizer. Like, almost nothing happens on our planet that isn't either made of those or came from something that was made with those, including wind turbines. They're just giant towers of steel with cement bases, and those giant blades are made out of oil. So, they, you know, they are giant physical embodiments of hydrocarbons. You, you couldn't have wind and solar without hydrocarbons. I have to ask the question why, again, what is the incentive to push things like wind and solar and ESG and, you know, all of this, you know, anti-fossil fuel agenda, where is this agenda coming from? When I speak in universities, kids are idealistic. They, they're maybe more physically comfortable than even you and I were when we grew up. The world's a wealthy, wonderful place today, and they want to have meaning. They want to be part of something bigger than just getting a job and paying their bills. 
And I think the sort of climate alarmist story that the world's going to end if everyone doesn't change their behavior, that's that sort of fits a religious hole for children today. They can be part of the solution. They know who the devils are. I they wish it was the, only children, right? Are, oh, yeah, well, there's <laughs> Hollywood. So, exactly. There's so many threads to it. And, and look, among politicians, the biggest driver of everything is by far is if you're going to redesign the energy system, it means you're going to redesign society. So if you're sort of a top-down politician, you want a larger government control, you want to pick winners and losers and, and redesign, so that's, that's intoxicating to a politician. Mm -hmm. I talk to politicians all the time about this. They know very little about climate change, but it's a reason to do things maybe they wanted to do anyway. I mean, take electric cars. They're barely needle movers in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. But maybe not even positive needle movers but they displace gasoline demand into the diesel that's used to mine and, and process and build these cars. It takes far more energy to build an electric car than to build a gasoline powered internal combustion engine. You've got to drive it like 70,000 miles before its greenhouse gases are equal. For the first 70,000 miles, it's higher. So you know that, that's not a meaningful climate solution, but well off people love electric cars. They're neat, they're sexy, mm -hmm. they're fast. So look, Politics is politics. There, there's not generally a deep thought out plan to save the planet. That's not what's driving politics and the policies you're hearing about. Okay, so I wanna go back to really fully understanding. So fossil fuels predominantly are not going anywhere right now because we need them for manufacturing, we need them for, for agriculture. There is no viable alternative, right? There is a possible viable alternative for electricity, which is wind and solar, but is not in fact a viable alternative because it still relies on fossil fuels to create the wind turbines and, and all the glass metal pieces that are involved in and the battery, correct? And so California is claiming that they're going to switch off into electric vehicles. So what are your thoughts on that? Is, is our electric bill just gonna go sky high? I mean, how is that viable? Well, I, I think it's very unlikely to happen. This getting rid of internal combustion engines is the seventh clean fuel mandate passed in California. They're 0 for 6 on the first six. I, I think it's a safe bet they're gonna be 0 for 7 on this time frame. You can electrify small vehicle transportation with big trucks, ships, with airplanes. Like, that's not going to happen. You can electrify small vehicles, but it's problematic. It's more expensive, and batteries don't last very long. So resale cars of, drop, of cars fall rapidly, and then you got to recycle or do something with the batteries. So I think electric cars are going to grow, and, and maybe they should. I think they're going to grow a lot in the next decade. But are they going to completely displace internal combustion engines in California? nearly zero chance of doing that. And of course, the cost would be enormous. But the pushback from people would be no. I mean, is there really going to be a pushback from people? I mean, they're very, very smart people gathering, whether at Davos or there is the Paris Climate Accord, where they're pressuring countries to move away from fossil fuels, zero emission. I mean, we saw what happened in Germany. Actually, let's talk a little bit about what has happened in Germany, because last time I checked, their electric bills are even higher than California, which I think is already so high. So in, in Germany, they pay 40 cents per, what is it? One kilowatt, kilowatt hour. hour. And in California, we pay 19 cents. And in many other states around America, they pay well, 9, 10, 11 cents. And so would if we go down this route that Europe has gone down, are we possibly looking at 40, 50 cents for electricity alone? Of course, if we tried to design our energy system like they've done it in Europe, of course, it, it would lead the same place. Germany, you mentioned, is a funny case study because Germany, they shrunk their subsidies to buy an electric car right in January 1. So in December, you could get 6,000 euros to buy an electric car. Now it's more like 4,000 euros. And in the month of January, EV sales dropped over 80%. So if you remove the subsidies, and, and they removed, they, they shrunk those subsidies because it's a huge budget impact, you know, you, you change human behavior. So with subsidies and mandates, can you drive change? Yeah, of course you can drive change, but only so far. Germany invested massively to try to change its electricity grid to dominantly wind and solar. They, they built a grid, the capacity of the wind and solar grid is as big as the capacity of the thermal grid they had before, but they still need the original grid. 
because at times when the wind's not blowing and the sun's not shining, which is get, exactly when you need right. electricity, it, it'll go down to less than 5% of the capacity of the whole electric and solar. So you need a grid almost the same size of the reliable power to keep the lights on. So that's expensive because you're basically running two electricity generating systems. And as one floats up and down with the weather, the other one you got to turn up and down to match that with the weather. It's not very practical. And in Germany as a whole, that's just electricity. Their largest source of electricity is still natural gas by far, and coal is number two. So they have their total energy went from 81% fossil fuel to 75 in their 25 year energy transition, aggressive plan, almost a trillion dollars in a, in a much smaller, half a trillion dollars in a much smaller economy than the US. So it's just hard to do. Well, correct me if I'm wrong about this, but many of the countries that have decided to go you know, zero emission or don't want to do their own fracking or extracting of, of uh, natural gas, for example, will buy their natural gas and fossil fuels from terrorist countries. So one of the ways that I like, I, I like to think about it logically is while Germany is all feeling good about itself because they're, you know, all in compliance with the Paris Climate Accord and, you know, they're being all green, they're actually subsidizing Russia, right? Because they yes. buy all of the natural gas from Russia. And so they're su essentially subsidizing a war, right? Or at least subsidizing a regime, which I'm assuming they don't align with, but they have no other choice because they still need the same amount of fossil fuels to power their own country. Yeah, I think there's this misunderstanding that Russia's invasion of Ukraine caused this energy crisis. I, th I think the causality is the other way. Russia invaded Ukraine at this time. Putin's wanted to do it for 22 years he's been in power. But we entered a global natural gas crisis, not enough natural gas that could be moved on seaborne. Not a crisis in our country or in Canada, but a global natural gas crisis began about September of 2021. So about five months before Putin invaded. That skyrocketed natural gas prices. As you said, Marissa, Russia supplies almost 50% of German natural gas, biggest supplier of their oil, major supplier of their coal. So I think Russia thought maximum leverage, now's the time to go. That exacerbated an already unfolding energy crisis. Europe, by reducing their own fossil fuel production, they didn't reduce their consumption very much. So they went from producing most of their oil and natural gas to importing most of their oil and natural gas. And as you said, you know, Russia is the biggest supplier. Algeria is another big supplier. Norway is the one local supplier. Oh, the Iranians as well, right? Iran is a major supplier of oil to Europe. So yeah, it's, you know, these, these policies that, as, as we started are not deeply thought out that, hey, this is gonna lead to a better world, a safer world, a cleaner world. It's just politically popular to oppose hydrocarbons. And we have a growing industry now that's now sizable. That if you give out money to wind and solar, you know, or biofuel subsidies, there's a big political interest group there. There's an impression that soon will be done with oil and gas. People honestly believe that in 10, 20, or 30 years at most, we won't use hydrocarbons. Ne nearly zero chance of that happening. But Why? it is conventional view. Why? Why is there zero chance that this could happen? Because we don't have replacements for so many of the things we use hydrocarbons for. I said nitrogen fertilizer. Like we have no other way to make nitrogen fertilizer, but mm. natural gas and a catalyst in a high energy process. Steel, cement, plastics, and fertilizer, those four pillars of the modern world, we use almost as much energy to produce those as the entire global electricity system. And those are take this high temperature process heat that right now you only get from hydrocarbons. You cannot get it from electricity, from wind or solar. You could get it from nuclear power. I'm a huge fan of nuclear and have mm. been since I was a kid. Like we should be doubling down, tripling You're ahead down. of your time. We should be tripling down on nuclear. Ultimately we will because it's an alternative that works. It has the high energy density. It, can, it works when it's dark. It works when the wind's not blowing. It's reliable power. And it can do more than just electricity. Nuclear can supply high temperature process heat that can aid in manufacturing. If we look out several hundred years from now, nuclear is probably the largest energy source on the planet. And you probably still have quite a significant role for hydrocarbons for their materials and specific applications. 15% of oil is not burnt for energy. It's used to make plastics and materials, asphalt, roads, Teslas. Tesla has a thousand pounds of oil in the car. Can you explain why there's so much pushback against nuclear? Is it just the trauma that we have from what happened in uh, Chernobyl or any of the other disasters? Well, it started even before that. You know, 
they formed the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in 1974, you know, to, to safely permit nuclear power plants and, and get in, you know, they formed a new government agency. It has not permitted one new nuclear power plant. Why? Not one. Why? Why? It works. It's clean. You can, you know, you, I'm assuming you can somewhat dispose of it and st if you store it safely. Why? Fear is powerful, very powerful. It's the same thing with climate. If you can make someone scared of something, you can generate opposition to it. So nuclear power has an incredible safety record, the best safety record of every energy alternative we have out there, including my industry, oil and natural gas. It's the safest power thing. It uses the smallest amount of land, the smallest amount of materials. The waste disposal thing is scary, but practically it's actually a pretty simple problem. Almost all the waste today is sitting in swimming pools. 70 years of waste from 100 nuclear power plants around the United States, it's all just stored locally. It should be stored deep underground, but still not a problem. Or in these giant canisters that are so heavy no one can move them. Mm -hmm. So it, it's a great technology, even in its first generation iteration. Now obviously the Soviet Chernobyl plant that was in Ukraine was mm -hmm. a horrific design and they did a crazy experiment and they blew it up. And this killed of order 100 people or so. Plus just, destroyed the environment, right? Not as much as you've heard or seen. You know, that has not always been, if you look at the UN report, the follow up on that, they actually attribute 56 deaths to Chernobyl 10 or 20 years after. So it's much smaller than you think. Mm -hmm. Fukushima in Japan, a magnitude nine earthquake. Mm -hmm. I think two people died, neither from radiation. They just drowned because the diesel generators, the backup generators were in the basement. Mm -hmm. So all sorts of mistakes that should have been done differently and of course would be done differently in something built now. But the safety record is strong in spite of these flaws. So nuclear will come back. Unfortunately, with the political environment, it's likely going to start coming back in China, in India, and elsewhere. The, the fear and the bureaucratic nature of the United States, it's just impossible. The, new, the only two nuclear plants that have come on in my adult life uh, are coming on in South Carolina recently. They were permitted 40 plus years ago. It's just so crazy. So basically, the way I understand it is, is this. We have to have fossil fuels in our lives. It's not going anywhere. We need it for agriculture. We need it for manufacturing. We need it pretty much also for electricity and for, for commute. The alternative of wind and solar don't work because they're actually more expensive to maintain than what we gain. And they're actually not that really good for the environment either. And so it's not a proper alternative. Nuclear energy is a great alternative, but for whatever reason, the government is not moving forward because there is fear or bureaucracy or whatever. And so fossil fuels is still here to stay. But we're not denying that the climate is getting warmer. We're not denying that fossil fuels contribute to the increase in the climate's temperature. But every time we talk about fossil fuels and the fact that the alternatives are not good enough, we're being called climate change deniers. Is that a fair synopsis of the situation? It's not that we're denying that there is a problem. We're just saying that there isn't a viable current solution to get rid of fossil fuels. And frankly, nobody wants to give up their current way of life. I think that's indicative of, of the struggle with the dialogue today. That is a reasonable summary of what goes on right now. You know, I wrote this Bettering Human Lives report, a hundred page long report to go over where the world gets energy, uh, how that's evolved with time, this problem of energy poverty. I wrote 12 pages on climate change, explaining the chemistry and physics of it, showing the data, the climate economic work, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has done. You know, and then, you know, you put these things all in trade-offs or issues, and I get called a denier all the time. Like, I've, I've been speaking on climate change for 20 years. I mean, not once did so, you say to me that you're denying that the climate is is heating, and not once did you say to me that you think that fossil fuels has nothing to do with it. But I think that the real bottom line is that we're spending so much time and energy and on fear mongering, having everybody basically freak out over climate change, that we're spending less time and energy on supporting innovation, right? I mean, isn't that at the end of the day what our educational institutions should do? They should invest more in research, research and innovation. If you want to get off of fossil fuels, you can't 
eliminate fossil fuels from our lives because nobody wants to give up their way of life. And frankly, we need to maintain the type of way of life that we have, right? We want to get people out of poverty, not bring more people into poverty, which what eliminating fossil fuels would do to a big segment of the world. So why, why aren't we seeing more incentive in innovation and why aren't we seeing educational institutions push for more innovation instead of fear mongering. Now you're right, that's the right answer. This fear cell has a snowballing problem. It's made kids fearful and therefore less optimistic. You know, less people are having kids because they say they're worried about the world they're bringing them into. Less people are studying science and engineering in our country. The jobs are awesome. I go to schools and, and, and pound the table for people to do it. But, but their view of science is it's authoritarian. You know, there, there is climate science. And if you say anything different than this unknown, you know, sacred scroll, you're unscientific. Well, that, that's, that's the opposite of what science is. It's about challenging and engaging and learning. How's our energy system going to get cleaner and lower greenhouse gas emissions? Innovation, better energy dense technologies. If we have energy technologies that are better than the one today, it won't take any government policy. People will shift to stuff that's cleaner and cheaper. That's the future, is to drive things to become better. Have but, you seen any progress in innovation? I know there was something about algae. Do you know anything about that? Well, the algae and biofuels, the problem is that that's, that's again, solar energy that's coming from the sun. It just takes a, a fair amount of land. On land, it's not practical at all. Algae, maybe in water, could be a little bit more viable, but it's just still a lot of resources to create a smaller amount of energy. What is oil? Oil is hundreds of millions of years of stored marine life, these tiny phytoplanktons that lived in the oceans. 100 million years ago, the world was much warmer, much higher CO2 concentration than today, so much more abundant life. Think of the dinosaurs, they're so gigantic, but there was enough plant matter, you could feed these animals that were monstrously bigger than elephants. Mm -hmm. And the oceans were incredibly rich with life. So it's, it's those phytoplankton that fall to the bottom of the ocean, they get buried, they get cooked. That's how oil and gas gets created. It's hundreds of millions of years of stored solar energy in these neat little dense packets. It took CO2 out of the atmosphere and buried it, and we are burning it today and releasing it back into the atmosphere at a faster rate than it got buried, which is why atmospheric CO2 concentration is going up. But they're just pretty awesome sources of energy. But will, will innovation and technology improve things? Of course it will. And we should focus on that instead of subsidizing things that now we've got decades showing they don't work. We hear endlessly wind and solar are cheaper. Where have they ever been installed and electricity prices came down? Has there been evidence of that? None, none. There's a thing called the levelized cost of energy. Well, when I put up a wind panel, a turbine, it cost me this amount and I maintain it for 20 years. Then I divide by how much energy I get out. Hey, it's, it's almost as cheap as natural gas. The problem is it's a different product. I give this Uber example. If, if, you, if you called an Uber and you weren't sure when it was gonna show up and you weren't sure where it was gonna drop you off, would you pay the same for that Uber as the one you get today that tells you when it's gonna show up and actually drives you wherever you want? Those are just two different products. Texas had that giant blackout and is really destroying their electricity grid because they pay the same amount per unit of electricity from something that's erratic and intermittent versus something that turns on and turns off and matches supply with demand. So what do you get? If you're gonna pay just as much for a lower quality product as a higher quality product, and you got subsidies to produce more lower quality product, they're gonna get more and more wind on their grid. And 200 people died a, a couple of years ago in that cold spell that swept through Texas. Mm -hmm. No, a, year, a little more than a year ago, just last winter. I always say energy's too important to be politicized or fear-mongered. It needs to be a little more sober, a little more fact-based because it enables our lives. As, as you keep saying, you make energy more expensive and less reliable, people have lower quality lives. What's also bizarre about the whole situation is the censorship that we're experiencing. You just recently experienced some censorship. You had a video explaining fossil fuels and you uploaded it onto LinkedIn and apparently LinkedIn had that video removed and Prager you many of our videos have been removed or targeted by YouTube or shadow banned on Facebook or we've received threatening emails from NewsGuard telling us that we can't show it, our videos with, you know, whether it's Schellenberger or Kunin or, or any of those. 
you're not running for office. I'm not running for office. I think both of us just want to have a better world uh, for, for ourselves and for our children, for our community, and we want viable solutions. And so when we try to speak about these things in a non-political way, we get targeted by these big tech companies. Why is that? There's certainly a crew of activists around there. Like my LinkedIn banning, I don't think that came from someone who worked at LinkedIn. I think people who are climate alarmists, this is a profession. You know, it's a money, it's a faith, it's a movement that any video that says the, the world isn't ending and we must do, you know, our, our formula, they try to get banned, you know, and they file complaints and they push and they find something. You know, as you saw, the Wall Street Journal did a story on this, looked into it, and they found a climate scientist, my 12 and a half minute video, who said one claim I made that droughts have not increased was incorrect. And it turns out my claim was correct, but I had to again provide the references and sources to show that. It is sad to see big tech censor ideas or perspectives they don't like. That's not healthy for society. It's too bad, but they're not gonna shut me up and they're not gonna shut you up. And so- Well, I did I got read some your optimism. article. I watched your video and then I read the article that was written about you in the Wall Street Journal. And then you had a rebuttal to that. And it was focused on your claim, or I guess you cited claims that there are not more hurricanes and the droughts are not getting worse. I am hearing claims everywhere. And I'll also hear many people say, well, I'm seeing more hurricanes than I've ever seen in my lifetime. So are hurricanes actually increasing either in strength or in frequency, or are they not? They are not. Depends on crosswinds, depends on sea surface temperature. So hurricanes go in, in cycles. Some year could have a lot, some year less. Maybe there's a 30 year swing where they're more frequent and then they're less frequent. Um, but if you look at the entire hurricane data set globally, United States, all landfalling hurricanes, all major hurricanes, there's not an upward trend in any of them. And again, I show all of that data in Bettering Human Lives. In fact, all of that data is in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports, which is where their conclusion is, is there an observable trend in hurricanes? No. Is there an observable uh, increase in tornadoes? No. Is there an observable increase in meteorologic drought, like it's raining less? No. Um, is there an increase in floods? No. So these are, they, everybody believes they are. Yes. But even the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, think of that. This is a bureaucracy that only exists if climate change is a problem. If you thought, ah, it's not that low a problem, you don't work for the IP. You don't, you're not an IPCC you're author out of anymore. A job. So they're reasonable humans. The technical people are, are following the data. But that's what the data says. But then you have this summary for policymakers and the media and politicians and, of course, some activist scientists that say, well, if I start the hurricane data in 1980 and from the low we had and then I plot it forward, I can show an upward trend. Hey, you do it in my state in Colorado all the time. You know, we have a snow tail data monitoring network from 1936. There is no trend in a change in the snowpack in Colorado over 86 years. But if you start it from a year of high snowpack, uh, you could show a downward trend. They do it all the time. Now we've had huge snowpacks. So you're not, you're I mean, that gonna, is basically, cut off the that's years. basically data manipulation. I mean, that, that's like them making it up for what? For the case of a good story? To what? To fit a narrative that there is some catastrophe coming our way? The media loves this. They love it. I, I send them data all the time. It does not stop them from saying these increasing storms due to climate change. You know, the, the it's... It's, I call it weather porn. People are so obsessed with, with storms and tornadoes and stuff all around the world. And of course, everyone is seeing more hurricanes today because every hurricane everywhere, if it's hitting where people are, is it's on the on news. It's on social media and, and everybody knows years ago, you didn't, that you didn't see it unless it hit your town. Right. But I mean, I would believe the same thing mm -hmm. if I didn't dive into the data. And it, all of it's pretty easily accessible. This is not controversial, like the oil guy's data versus the mm -hmm. climate data. There is pretty good databases on hurricanes in all different forms. Accumulated cyclonic energy, or ACE, is the sum of all hurricanes, time, intensity over the world. No upward trend. Well, I, I, I would say that I would believe all this stuff from the media and the education system too, because there, unless you search for an alternative perspective and you really look under the hood and you're willing to do all the work, which I had done, it's hard to really believe otherwise. I mean, this is really why I wanted to have these books up here because 
I think that if you read Michael Schellenberger's research and book and you read Steve Coonan's book and you read Alex Epstein, then you'll be in a place where I'm at, where you're asking these questions of why, why, why? Why? Why would we ruin our way of life and not also provide the opportunity of the way of life that we have to folks in Africa, right? If Africa had more access, and I think they're starting to realize that, right? If they have more access to fossil fuels, they will be able to lift their people out of poverty. And when you lift people out of poverty, that means better education, better medical condition, you know, probably less civil unrest. Am I right? Here's my biggest, biggest problem with the climate alarmist movement. So the, the world's about 8 billion people, roughly a third of them, two and a half billion people cook their daily meals, burning wood, dung, and agricultural waste indoor in their huts. Those smoky fires that we think are romantic when you go away to a cabin. they're basically breathing soot. And they're breathing that soot, that particulate matter. And according to the World Health Organization, that kills about 3 million people a year. Three million people a year, every, every year die because they do not have access to fossil they don't fuel. Because they don't have access to a clean, a simple clean, it costs about $50 to have a propane cook stove and a refillable canister. Now about 100 million people a year are making this jump to clean cooking stoves. And who are the three million people who die? Women and children. Who's over the fire all cooking. day? Who gathers the wood, who cooks and who does that? So these enormous health impacts, three million deaths a year, that's of order the rate of deaths we had from COVID globally during the during the last three years. Well, everybody is wor worried about the nuclear plants that you know essentially exploded, but the deaths are much more severe when people have no access to energy. Dramatically so, three million just from clean cooking stoves. And at the COP conference, the Congress of the Parties, the climate conference in Glasgow, a year and a half ago, so the fall of twenty one. A year and a half ago, 19 nations, including the United States, the United Kingdom, Canada, the wealthy nations of the world, pledged they would no longer lend to developing nations, poor nations, for hydrocarbon infrastructure development. They will not help reduce that 3 million deaths a year. Okay, and they I, were proud here comes of this another why. I mean, why? What is the motive to do that? Because A, they're uneducated, shallow, or evil, or some combination of that two, and they're playing to their audience at home that is bombarded with fossil fuels are evil, they're destroying the planet, they're the greatest human health threat. Basically, rich, educated people who have access to fossil fuel don't understand how good we have it, and so we just don't care whether poor people have access to it or not. I mean, that is bluntly what is going on. It's shameful. And, and they are proud to pledge that they're going to try to stand in the way of the access for that two and a half billion people to get lives like you and I have and to save three, three million lives a year. Like to me, you know, that's not just nuts. It's immoral. It's really wrong. It's wrong. So I can't tell you how many businesses I've visited where they have proudly told me that they're now implementing ESG, environmentally and socially governed. And they're actually doing this because they're claiming that it's the moral thing to do. I mean, we just talked about morality and how wrong it is that we're not offering access to fossil fuels to countries that are developing and need access to that. And now American businesses are implementing ESG. What is going on over there? A minority of people, but the people that control the large investment firms have bought onto this. I don't know why they bought onto it. For sure, you make a higher fee if you're running an ESG fund than just a, a blind index fund. So there's a business reason if you're a money manager. It's Is a premium the fee product. just because you can charge people who bought into this whole farce? You charge more for managing that fund because you have to go out and evaluate who the most virtuous companies are by this ESG criterion. So when I wrote our ESG, and maybe it's more of an anti-ESG report, this I mentioned, Bettering Human Lives, I talk about two things really changed the world. We had 30 years, roughly 30 year life expectancy throughout all of human history, until about 200 years ago. Today it's 72, more than a doubling and of climbing, human life. And climbing, right? Yes, and climbing. More than a doubling of human life expectancy, inflation adjusted, more than a tenfold increase in the average wealth of each person, Extreme poverty went from 90% of the world to 8 or 9% of the world. So this incredibly positive thing, two things drove that, in my opinion. One is bottom-up social organization, human liberty. Kings and queens or, or, or mercantilism, you only can start a company if the government gives you a license. That only changed in the 1840s. You and I could just go out and start a company. That wasn't true 200 years ago. 
Bottom-up liberty and hydrocarbons are why we live twice as longer, why we have planes, trains, and automobiles, and modern medicine, and, and, and multiple outfits of clothes, and all, these, and all these other things. And the ESG movement, in my opinion, is mostly against both of those. They're preaching you've got to show your net zero path to 2050. Heck, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, their own economics, shows net zero 2050 as a tens of trillions of dollars human impoverishment program. I mean, the costs massively exceed their own projected benefits. And they know that. It. And they know that. And they want to define, they want you to fill in numbers and check boxes to see how virtuous you are. So it's Top just down definition of virtue. Signaling. Maybe it's well-intentioned, but I think that, I, I, I find it appalling. We're not going to have a few people on the coast decide which criterion are going to decide which business is virtuous and which is not. And they clearly know nothing about the trade-offs of greenhouse gas emissions versus energy resources versus poverty. And so what I did was write a report and say, this is, this is what I think. The world actually right now needs a lot more hydrocarbons, not less, particularly in low-income nations and low-income countries. And we need a sober, long-term mentality about better energy technologies. Just further subsidizing technologies that don't work, that's not, there's no human betterment in that. The government gets involved and puts on these regulations. I mean, essentially, ESG, especially, I mean, specifically the environmental side of it, it may even cause people to not focus on innovation because they think that they're helping. Let's put more money in innovation rather than in waste money on things that don't work. Exactly. If the government is picking winners and losers, it's not going to be the They're quality of the service it. that's going to do. I mean, that's, that's sort of a case of history. And think of the whole societal impact. In the United Kingdom, the U.S. in total greenhouse gas emissions has reduced ours way more than anywhere else, but we're by far the biggest economy. So the largest in percentage terms is the United Kingdom. They've dropped their greenhouse gas emissions by 40%. That sounds heroic. But they've also had a 30% drop in total energy consumption. So what happens if you make energy expensive and unreliable, all the manufacturing, all the stuff that uses energy intensely just leaves your country. So instead of being built with blue collar workers in the Midlands of England in a modern natural gas powered factory, it's being built in Vietnam or China or Indonesia in a coal fired plant. And then they're loaded on a giant ship powered by diesel and brought back to the United Kingdom. And they think this is green. This isn't green, this isn't greenhouse gas reduction. It's ultimately just reducing the job opportunities of blue collar, lower income people work in more energy intensive jobs, and energy is a larger percent of their expenditures. So it, it's sort of a reverse Robin Hood scheme. When you make energy expensive and subsidize rich connected business people, you're just floating money to the top and you're draining opportunity and money from people in the bottom half. So when you're saying that the UK's energy consumption went down, it's a bad thing because it caused less jobs and less manufacturing within the UK. I mean, has their GDP decreased? No, their GDP grew because they're huge in finance and technology. London is boomed. It's like New York and San Francisco booming, but Alabama right, getting crushed. Right, but they're crushed. still relying on all the natural sources, the natural energy sources that they need, so they just import that. They import it. The birthplace of the Industrial Revolution, where modern manufacturing, they, they were sending textiles around the planet, British manufacturing. Now it is mostly gone. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just tragic. Well, glad. I'm, I'm glad you brought this up because I have another question. And that is another thing that I just learned recently. The difference between the independents, which are the independent oil and gas manufacturers in the United States versus the large global ones. My reaction when I heard about them was, why did I never hear about these independents? Why aren't we supporting them so that we don't become more reliant on what I call terrorist regimes, which include Russia, China, Iran, et cetera, where, you know, ultimately we don't want to rely on external factors to have them here in the United States. Why are we squashing the independents? Again, politics, politics. Wait, explain what independents are, because I'm not sure that others have learned so what they're, it is. They're what we call the majors or the integrated companies, you know, Exxon, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, you know, British Petroleum. So these are large companies that produce oil and gas around the world. They refine oil and gas into diesel fuel and jet fuel and gasoline. They operate a pipeline network. So they're big, awesome companies, but they're very different than the independents. By the way, I learned that they're also big investors in solar and wind, right? Many of them actually have a vested interest in solar and wind, and so they push both. 
Well, they do it for political purposes. British Petroleum was the leader in that. Remember Beyond Petroleum? Yes. You know? So BP just announced record ever earnings last year, but from oil and gas, and that they were going to roll back their rate of investment in alternative energies because the returns were not there. Their stock has been crushed. People think you don't even know what you want. Do you want to be an oil and gas company or do you want to be a renewable company? Or they want to be an apologizing oil and gas company that also dabbles in renewables. Maybe not a great business model. I don't know. Oh, that's some great but, for uh, virtue signaling. Okay. Um, but it hasn't, I don't think it's worked great for the business. And of course, the oil and gas production parts of BP are great. I mean, BPX is sort of the American oil and gas. It's like American independent owned by BP. It's a hard driving, fabulous company that's growing its oil and gas production in the United States. The other independents are like, you know, EOG and Devin, you know, or PDC, smaller companies. These are sort of, you know, market cap, you know, one to $40 billion companies, much smaller than the majors. But they're the main oil and gas producers in this country. And they're the people who drove the innovations that started the shale revolution. If you make it harder to drill for oil and gas in the United States, you don't reduce the demand for oil and gas, right? You just produce less of it in the United States and we import more from Iran or Saudi Arabia or Venezuela or somewhere else overseas, which of course means dirtier practices, higher greenhouse gas emissions, higher pollutants, the whole ban drilling on federal land. I'm like, the only thing we know for sure if we did that was we'd have higher global greenhouse gas emissions and higher pollutants. Nothing else might change, meaning because it wouldn't be produced in the United States with, you know, tighter regulations and, and, you know, more modern, wealthy, high-tech companies that do this with the smallest footprint possible. It would just be produced somewhere else. So are independent American oil and gas companies being limited? Are they you know, being squashed or are they being supported? I mean, I hope we're supporting them. We're not supporting them. You know, right now we're making them their ability to drill oil and gas wells harder. Very hard to get permits on federal land. So some of these companies, half their acreage might be on federal land, half on private. They're having to disproportionately drill on, drill on private lands. Very hard to get a pipeline. If you produce oil and gas in a new area, you got to build a pipeline to move it to the refinery or to the coast to send that natural gas to Europe, whatever it is. But building that infrastructure has become harder, which means on the margin, they're drilling less wells than they would otherwise. And it means oil and gas prices are higher. So we're hurting their ability to drill oil and gas wells, but we're driving their profits up because this, these restrictions on supply are driving the prices of oil and natural gas up. Yeah, well, so their, I don't their care. stockholders are winning, but their hearts aren't winning. Yeah, they, well, want it. they want to power I mean, America. I don't care about their profits. I want America to be independent. I don't want to be dependent on terrorist countries. So any concerned citizen who is watching this should say to themselves, well, wait a second. We know we're going to need the fossil fuels anyway. Wouldn't we want to rely on our own American manufacturers? Why not open it up to more opportunities for more drillers within the United States to rely on the resources that we have here in our country and not rely on China, Russia, Iran, Venezuela, and all these other places that simply don't, they simply wish us ill. Let's just say it frankly. I'm aligned 100% with that. Our industry is aligned with that, 100% with that. And that is the message we bring to carry to Washington, to our state politicians, to everyone. Even though in the short run, it's, it's contrary to our business interests, but it's good for the country. Mm -hmm. And it's the right thing to do. If we have fantastic resources here and great workers, we can develop it in the cleanest, smallest impact way, we should do it. So, okay, basic thing I learned when I was in college, the very few things I learned at UCLA, supply and demand, okay? So there's clearly a demand that's not going to go away. Supply is being squashed. Does that mean that if I invest right now in, in energy, specifically maybe in independence, if I want to invest in something that I know all the major financial institutions are virtue signaling and are afraid to invest in, should it should that be something my husband and I consider investing in? I think the answer is yes. You look at investment, people say, well, of course this is a great buy. This is a great company. The question is, it's a great company. Are the expectations in it better than it really is or worse than it really is? A great company that people view as outstanding is not a good investment. But in our industry, everybody thinks we're going to be gone in 20 years. Is the reality going to be better than expectations? I think yes. It's one of the things that's really caused a swing back in ESG investing. The ESG investing yeah. took off maybe 10 years ago as the shale revolution is hitting its peak. So the shale revolution exploded U.S. oil and natural gas production. Great for America. Drove down prices and all that. Not great for the companies in our industry. 
They drilled too much. They drove the prices down. Good mm. for the customers, good for the world, not good for the companies. So if you were an ESG investor and didn't own oil and gas, well, that was a benefit to your performance. But the last two years, by far and away, the best performing sector has been oil and gas. So ESG funds that weren't investing in oil and gas companies have all underperformed the average or the metrics, and that's hurting their business. But today, oil and gas companies still trade at much lower multiples on earnings, multiples on cash flow um, than all the other sectors. So yeah, it's, it's priced as if we're about to go out of business, but I think the odds of us going out of business soon are pretty low. It sounds like I should run home and tell my husband that we should invest. How does one do that? Is there like public funds? Yeah, I mean, like I invest only in individual companies, but I know them all. But yeah, there there absolutely are uh, index funds, simple ways to do oh, it. Oh, I think Vivek fact, Ramaswamy is starting one, right? I was going to mention, one, right? Vivek did start one. It's called Drill. So the ticker's D-R-L-L. Oh, good. It's I'm just, happy to give him a shout out because his stuff is so good. He, yeah. Vivek is right on and he's bold and he's outspoken. And Drill is fantastic because it is just a, an index of all the large companies in the oil and gas business with no, no ESG, no pleading with those companies to get out of oil and gas business, but to celebrate what they do and support them. So that's probably the single best way. It's the only fund. I, I buy individual stocks. I own shares in Drill. Oh, wow. um, and I, I, I recommend it as probably the best way if you want exposure to the oil and gas sector. Oh, very cool. Final note. It's Earth Day coming up this weekend. Yes, yes, indeed. And uh, I know both you and I are conservatives who love the Earth. And so... Any final words? My wife and I are mountain climbers, skiers, outdoor passion. I'm a longtime board member of a fantastic free market environmental group called PERC. So I celebrate uh, making the earth a better, cleaner, more, more fabulous place to live our lives in. And I, I would recommend people look into the role that hydrocarbons have played there. I show in, in, in Bettering Human Lives a picture of the island of Hispanola. You, it's, you can see the border between North and South Korea at night. You can see the border between Haiti and the Dominican Republic during the day because Dominican Republic is a mm. wealthier country. It's almost all of its energy from oil and natural gas. It's got lush rainforests and a thriving tourist industry. Haiti, right across the border, still gets the majority of its energy it's from oil here, and natural right? gas, but it's got enough people living in the country that don't have enough wealth that they still get energy the way all of our ancestors did, which is to cut down trees and burn them for a fuel source. So I, I think my title over it is Energy Access is Green. And the, the arrival of fossil fuels making agriculture more efficient has shrunk the amount of farmland we need to produce a certain amount of food. And in the U.S., until the ethanol mandates, we were returning enormous amounts of land back to grasslands and forest because of efficiencies brought about by fossil fuels. Do we have negative impacts? Sure, we do. But we have positive impacts as, as well. And I think if you look at them and balance, the positives are much bigger than the negatives. Happy Earth Day, Marissa. Happy Earth Day, Chris. And for those of you watching, if you want to get educated as I have, I really want to encourage you to read these books. You have Michael Schellenberger, Stephen Koonin, and Alex Epstein. And if you don't have the time to read the books, we have five-minute videos by all of these presenters. Great, thoughtful reads full of data by people not in the oil and gas industry like me, in fact, from very different yeah, fields these are all that, that I am. But, uh, but looking at the same data and with the same human first mentality, of course, you'll come to a, a, a similar perspective, but told very differently. Excellent books. I, I recommend yeah. them to all the watchers. Awesome. Oh, and also Bjorn Lomberg. Bjorn's latest book, False Alarm from a few years ago, is basically the simplest way. You don't want to read the two, three, four thousand page IPCC reports. Bjorn Lomborg summarizes what's in those reports mm -hmm. um, in a very digestible way. Great videos as well. And he's not a climate change denier, none of the ad hominem attacks that people put on us. A, he was a Greenpeace member and university professor at Aarhus University in Denmark when he jumped into this movement. So a lover of the environment, driven by it, and, and uh, didn't get the, the role of fossil fuels until he dove into the facts. But a, a brilliant guy and a great writer. I recommend that book as well. Right. Now, happy Earth Day. Happy Earth Day.